You are watching Good Morning Nigeria and we're live on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority from our Abuja headquarters studios. As a prompt for the second part of our conversation on domestic violence, let's listen into the excerpts from uh, the first part, which was yesterday. And those excerpts are compiled by our correspondent, Joseph Olsen. <laughs> This problem is endemic. It just takes the bold to speak about it. And I'm happy about one thing. As saddening as the situation is, people are beginning to speak out. That's why we're getting the numbers. We got one point, over 1.7 million complaints in total in 2021. Out of that 1.7 million, over 900,000 was on women and children. You want to speak when it's too late. What have you done? They are saying that they were hearing the way he brutalizes her. I said, but what have you done to help rescue her, this woman? This woman will be beaten and thrown out. The son says, not once, not twice. He beats her and throws her out, and she sleeps outside, locks the gate. She sleeps in an uncompleted building, and in the morning she will crawl back and be on her knees, begging him. The neighbors are aware. Nobody reported it. She might certainly be under some influence because the whole scenario doesn't sound or look normal. Most of the cases that are reported to the police are treated as family matter. A woman will go on to the police with blood and everything and they will say, go back to your husband. Or the man will go, go back to your husband. Go and settle. Are you not man enough to settle your, your matter? At all? Why are you bringing it here? We have to understand that domestic violence is a crime. And if we do not understand that and treat it as a crime, we will keep having the numbers rising. And so every institution must be reinforced to ensure that these things are treated as crime and people punished for it. But as a result of the emerging trends in sexual gender-based violence, child abuse and what have you, the police responded adequately and I think in 2002, the police established for the first time, the Nigeria police established at the first CID level, the Apex Investigative Department in the Nigeria police established a gender unit. In my introduction, I said it very clearly. The police did not only stop at that. Now the police have established gender decks in the 36 commands of the Federation. All right, and uh, we have a guest uh, here in our studio uh, to be part of the second leg of our conversation on domestic violence. Uh, first, let me introduce uh, Harry Obey. Harry is the Director, Women and Children Department, National Human Rights Commission. We well, thank you for uh, joining us, Harry. Thank, thank you me. very much, Karen. Happy okay. to be here. Okay, also on the program this morning, uh, we have uh, Rita Bassi. Rita Bass is a domestic violence survivor and a counselor. Welcome to the program. Thank you, sir. Uh, we also would like to introduce uh, Sani Ama Rabi. Uh, Sani Ama Rabi is the acting director of Social Welfare Department of Social Development Secretariat in the FCT. <coughs> it's good to have you, Jonathan, this morning. Thank you. All right, so in addition to uh, those two guests, uh, by the way, Harry Obey was with us on the program yesterday. We are having another guest who was also with us yesterday, and uh, he's uh, Professor Benjamin Ahige of the Department of Psychology at the University of Ibadan. He's joining us from our, our Ibadan Network Center. Professor Ahige, we appreciate uh, your being with us again this morning. Very much. Good morning. All right, and then uh, joining us via Zoom from Lagos is uh, Titi Lola uh, Vivo Adeniye, Executive Secretary of the Lagos State Domestic and Sexual Violence Agency. Uh, Titi Lola uh, Adeniye, it's our pleasure to have you on the program this morning uh, with us uh, from Lagos. Good morning, thank you for having me. All right. I hope you had the benefit of uh, listening to some of the excerpts from our conversation yesterday. Uh, let's begin the conversation with you. The Zoom connection is, is clear this time. Uh, what is the state of domestic violence 
in Lagos, one of uh, the country's uh, most populous states. Okay. Um, so what we've seen over the past five, six years is a steady increase of formal and informal reporting of domestic violence, sexual violence, and child abuse. The data shows that people are speaking up more. People are approaching relevant institutions like mine, um, governmental organizations, non-governmental organizations, civil society organizations. They are reporting cases. Before now, you know, we had that culture of silence where people are not encouraged to speak up and speak out. But we are gradually breaking that culture of silence. People are speaking up more and speaking out. We are also seeing people brought to book. We are seeing convictions, cases of sexual violence, for instance, and um, perpetrators, defendants are being punished for their crimes. So people, are in, people now know Right, that um, there are consequences for actions. If you commit crimes, you will be punished. We're also seeing demonstration of political will and in legal state. We have the governor, Mr. Governor Sowoli, um, speaking up about the issues, walking the talk. We have the Honorable Attorney General ensuring that he personally prosecutes these cases. Um, we're also seeing innovations that are introduced by the state to ensure that these issues get the, the deserved attention that they require to ensure that we are able to reverse this very, very worrisome trend. Okay, okay. Um, we'll, we'll get back to you um, for further uh, conversations. Uh, but now let's return to our studio here. We have uh, Rita Bassi. She's the domestic violence survivor. Yeah, well, I would say share your experience or, or something, but if you deem it necessary, um, let our viewers know uh, what this feeling is all about and uh, uh, how someone who is battered, as in the case of Fusunachi, who didn't want to let out, you know, what the experience she's been having for over the years until her death, will handle such a situation because there could be many more. Uh, in her shoes, who wouldn't want to, uh, you know, get a divorce because of her religious belief and, and what have you. And of course, they live with a man who is, is a bully, right? So let's uh, have your own take on uh, this issue of uh, uh, domestic violence and how best you know, it could be handled, especially uh, from the, the, the women uh, folk. Thank you very much. Well, um now, when I heard of uh, Osinachi's um, story, I can easily relate because um, <laughs> everything there is, this is the same characteristics, you know, the abuser and the victim, the same thing, especially when the abuser actually succeeded in um, victimizing the victim or demoralizing the victim to the point of our world or its world because Anyone can be a, a, a victim, anyone can be an abuser. It's not about the gender anywhere. So mostly female are more, so it's like it's all about female. No, men too can be abused. So it, it, it makes the, the abuser, if the abuser succeed in making the victim feel that his or her world is depending on him, there is nothing you can do. And... Um, I went through it practically. Can imagine marrying to a, a pastor, a clergy, and um, he was everything good, everything any woman can dream to have, and um, you know everything. There was no wrong anywhere. Even when I make a mistake, it was like, oh, I'm already prepared for you. You know, you are all that I wanted, and all that. And five days along the line after wedding. We did, you know, and uh, the sense I saw became a beast. Everything that was so good about me became suddenly became so wrong. My food that he loved so much, there must be complaint. Everything was like when somebody, my auntie was asking me, why didn't you let us know? Why, what really happened? Everything can uh, uh, trigger him. I mean, you, he, he doesn't want you to pray. You stop praying, can trigger him. He like hot food. You, you bring hot food, can trigger him. He, he wants the, the, the other side of uh, sex in bed and you give it, can trigger. Anything can trigger the abuser. And when once he succeeds in um, 
making you feel that it's helping you and it's the Satan that is really the, the problem here is the outsiders that are really causing the problem and you, you, you believed him. <laughs> there is no word for you again because you are leaving his world. And, um, and I was leaving that world in silence like that for like more than two years. Everything, I was smiling outside. Everybody see me as a laughing, smiling Rita, but I was dying. I was dying. I was dying in silence because of the fear of my faith, the fear of uh, what people will say, the fear of my family, you know, and all that. So I was just dying. But it came to the point that um, what really helped mine is because I was, when I was in, under, uh, uh, in the university, you know, undergraduate, being a counsel counseling psychology student, we were sent for practicum. So in practicum, I was able to help younger ones to rediscover themselves, okay? And it was actually those experiences. I didn't know I was preparing my future because I always drop this word with them. I say, who are you? What are you looking for? What do you really want? You know, all those stuff. I was making them to rediscover who they are, especially academically. So I said, if you don't define yourself to yourself of who you are and to people around you, that people around you will define you of who you are not. And if care is not taken, you start dancing their, their, their drum beat and you start acting their script. And that's not who you are. Now who you are. You know, I always drop those words there. Do you know, when I was really a shadow of myself, one of those days, he has finished beating me and left with my phone. No communication. So, and I look at myself in the mirror. I was really a shadow of myself. I was like, Rita, who are you? Are you what this man is calling there at night? Because he was calling me a slave, but I, uh, he married me with his money. He can treat me any way he wants and can have his way any time, any day, you know. And this person is a pastor, you take? Of course, with a very big Bible. And he, he made the congregation was like, he, he, he was so proud to even stand one of the days in the congregation that uh, my wife believed me so much. There's nothing you can tell my wife that uh, he will believe you. She believed me so much. Honestly, he was actually trying to make me do that. I was believing everything he says. But that day I asked myself that question. And I, was, I said, I'm a counselor. My senses started coming to me. Have I reported this thing to any counselor? That early time when he, he, he was doing that, sometimes we'll, when he come back to his senses, we plead. I did not know when this thing happened, all those stuff. And I was okay, let's meet a counselor. He accepted. Uh, when it was the day, he said, there's nothing wrong with him. What are they going to tell him? Is he not the counselor? He counselor all that and all that. But me, on my own, I decided to confide with some counselors, professional counselors. You know, at least I was able to confide with one that time. Then another one. I had like three counselors in different stages of my life. So she was trying to really build me up to be emotionally stable. Because that actually what I needed then. I was emotionally stable. I started going through online classes on personal development to really take control of my thoughts. Because my thoughts was almost taken out of me. I was not owning my thoughts again. So... You know, you know, Richard, I'd like yeah. to jump in here a little bit. We've allowed you to narrate your experience so that our viewers can benefit from it. Uh, I, I, I didn't quite get the beginning of, if we call it a crisis, uh, early on. I mean, you said you were married for two years. Uh, you mentioned something about five days. Maybe to the extent that you may wish to disclose. And by the way, let's also mention this, that as uh, the uh, executive secretary of the uh, agency in Lagos mentioned, people are coming out. Uh, there is uh, a very well-known uh, tennis, uh, table tennis player, uh, uh, Oshinaike, who has also come out uh, to uh, disclose, you know, the domestic violence that she suffered. When did this start? I mean, was it five years after you got married, or uh, when did it start, and how did it start? Uh, and it, 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 did you know the person you married? Did you court, or it was just uh, an attraction that? Uh... Of course, it wasn't an attraction. We 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 dated. We dated because um, he was my my in law 
pastor. My in-law was his assistant pastor. Okay? So, the, the, my in-law, you need to know when, it was my in-law that introduced him to me. You need to know how my in-law esteems him. Everybody in the community know this man like a sense, of course, even till tomorrow, they see him as his, I don't think, there's, except people he has affected one or the other can say it otherwise. And that was one of my reasons of keeping silent. Who would believe me? Of course, he, he, they, see, they saw him as a saint, including my in-law, because I was keeping silent to the point where I had to start letting people that can you know, hold themselves to understand. Like the in-law, I told him, he could not believe it until he saw it by himself. I, I mentioned the day there was, he has been seizing my phone like that because anything is to seize me. Sometimes it locked me inside the door and lock the gate of our house outside so i can't go out no communication no no other person can know what is happening so of course the day he actually sees my phone i had a, a appointment with my in-law and he was trying to get in touch with me nowhere so he had to drive down to the house and he found out that i was since i couldn't come out so I was standing outside and I was telling him what happened that day, you know, and we dated. He came to, in fact, when we were cutting through phone, he proposed to me through phone. I said, I don't know you. I can't uh, I said, well, 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 phone proposal. I don't know you. It's okay. I should come down. He's the overseer of the overseer of his church. I should come down. He cannot leave his folks. You know, this is what God called him to. I said, well, if you can't come down, let me see you. I can't come down. See, it was something like that. He, he came down to answer a yes or no from me. Just coming down. We went through um, marriage counseling. <laughs> all these people, they are all alive. And so many questions they were asking him. He was answering it as a prepared, ready man. Not just answering. He showed me those people he was with me here in Abu Jada. He was prepared to be a good husband. As much as I was prepared to be a good wife. You know, he showed me everything good. To the point that one of the days we went for counseling. And my auntie was there. And it, so the, my auntie is like, she saw something. She called me outside. He said, Rita, I think you really need to look down again. There is something about this guy that is, I said, ah, auntie, this is the man that showed me. He's the, be he's the best I've ever had so far. So you can imagine a, a woman like me. People see me as someone that selected a lot, you know? But you can imagine me coming up to say he was the best. You know, he showed me to be the best, honestly. He should. Well, well, well we, we, will, uh, we, we will stop you at this point. Uh, of course, uh, in the course of the program, we'll also I'll talk to you about the other aspects of him. Uh, what really, uh, tell you secondly, is that uh, he said the man is a pastor, and the uh, Sinachi's uh, husband is also referred to as a, as a pastor as well. And uh, if pastors cannot manage uh, their families, I wonder who will. Uh, now, let's... Uh, yeah, bring in uh, Sani Ama Rabi, the acting director of social welfare department of uh, uh, in the FCT here. Uh, what is the state of uh, family, uh, rather, uh, uh, domestic violence in Abuja? Have you been receiving reports uh, from any part of the uh, FCT in connection? Will you give us a data of uh, what it's been like in the past couple of years? Well, in FCT, uh, Social Development Secretariat, we have a unit that manages gender-based violence. The unit works in conjunction with European Union and the Office of the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. We used to have some reports. Sometimes it's not the victim that reports. It's concerned citizen in many cases. But in most cases, I describe that even if the case is reported, as you start the case, Somewhere along the line, the victim themselves will decide to abscond or not like to continue. These are some of the cases that we do have. And uh, we have a family court that uh, when we try to manage it at the counseling level, if it doesn't work out, we will now refer the case to the family court. 
is that the family court that the judge, the presiding judge will determine if the court, the case will reach magistrate court whereby it to be treated on criminal basis. And um, we have some NGOs that are assisting in advocating. And we equally have some, well, you know, spiritual How ideas. serious is the issue of domestic violence in the Federal Capital Territory? Well, to be honest, it's somehow serious. And uh, when I say it's serious, in case it is discovered that either a house, uh, house help, in most cases, we do have this case on house help. We don't have it much on between the spouses in Abuja here. Most of the cases, it's discovered that it's on either the house help. Okay. Uh, well, thanks. We'll come back to you, uh, uh, Sonny uh, Rabi. I, I just want the uh, Executive Secretary of the Lagos Agency, that's the Agency on Domestic and Sexual Violence, uh, Titi Vavo Adeneye, who is with us via Zoom, to clarify uh, this point for, for our viewers. Sometimes there is a tendency to conflate domestic violence and uh, sexual violence. Uh, we do know that sometimes they may occur in the same uh, in the same milieu, but our critical focus this morning is essentially on domestic violence. That is between spouses, uh, between partners, uh, and, and so on and so forth, and less uh, on sexual violence, an issue that we had earlier uh, also dealt with. And the points that you raised about increased reportage and the breaking of the culture of silence as well as the political will uh, to prosecute these cases. Those points are noted, but tell us, I mean, for a state like Lagos, as I said, uh, between Lagos and, and Kano, you have two of the most popular states in the Federation and a lot of also congestion. What, what do we know about the incidence of domestic violence and how is this manifesting in your state? Okay, thank you so much. Um, Majority of the cases that the domestic and sexual violence agency handles actually is actually domestic violence. Last year we did them um, three thousand nine hundred and forty three cases. Out of that three thousand nine hundred and forty three, sixty percent was on domestic violence. And as you rightly said, violence between intimate partners, violence that uh, occurs in the home. And you know that domestic violence is not just physical abuse, there's economic abuse, emotional abuse, verbal stalking and harassment and um, so we have more cases of um, domestic violence being reported not just by the victims of the survivors but even by people who refer to as mandated reporters and um, whistleblowers people that see something in the community and say something and do something about it and for us in Lagos state we don't look at domestic violence as just criminal because it is civil in nature as well and if we leverage on the provisions on the protection against domestic violence law, we have a, 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 um, an opportunity to actually go to the court and obtain what is called a protection or restraining order against the alleged perpetrator. So even when you have cases where the survivors are not willing to prosecute, you know, and, and to, to explore criminal measures of curtailing the situation, we have civil remedies that we can leverage on. For instance, obtaining a restraining order, you know, granted by the court, restraining the alleged abuser from coming um, close to the survival, to the, to the person's place of work and or, or, um, uh, ETC. So, yes, majority of our cases are actually domestic. Oh, okay, um, let's go to Ibadan, where we have uh, Benjamin uh, here, Department of Psychology, University of Ibadan. So I would like you to look at this uh, very, uh, you know, aspect of our conversation uh, from uh, Rita. Uh, he said that uh, there could be a situation where the abuser will cow uh, the abuse, you know, uh, applying some psychology on the on the abuse to the point where the abuse cannot even uh, reveal what uh, she has been going through, uh, as in the case of uh, Osinachi, and uh, from what. Uh, uh, Sani Amara, uh, Rabbi told us now that uh, in FCT here, the many cases they have handled uh, were cases where uh, concerned citizens will report to uh, their office about uh, an abuse 
and uh, at a stage the abused could be the person that will now stop the proceedings uh, from the investigation and what have you. So, as a psychologist, what do you think it's happening? How could this happen that someone is suffering you know, in the hands of an abuser uh, yet could not even uh, report to anybody that she is suffering? Osinachi, in, in the case we're talking about, is a key player in, in a big church in, in, in Abuja here, and she couldn't even tell you know, the, the overseer or, 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 of that church who could have you know, played a role in uh, stopping her husband from continuing uh, abusing her you know, before she died. Well, thank you very much. The case is often rampant when it comes to relationship between the abuser and the abused, especially when it has to do with a um, marital relationship. Now, when the couple come together, there's an agreement of being together, and there are some uh, information, some cultural information or religious information that tend to act on their cognition which is supposed to bound, bind them together. Now after they've lived for a while and this situation of violence commences or abuse commences, the earlier the abused is able to um, free herself from it, the better. Otherwise, once it stays for a while, it becomes difficult for the individual to free herself. The reason is that they will have what we call um, Stockholm's, Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome is a psychological syndrome whereby two persons are related in the form that one has a sort of um, superiority over the other, like we have in a marital relationship or in a captive situation. Because of the time they've lived together, there's what we also refer to as learned helplessness. In learned helplessness, the individual has become so adjusted to the problem, uh, has now even developed some coping strategies of trying to help himself or herself out of the problem. That the individual at times sees some positive aspects of the abuser and overrates, or what we may refer to as overvalue, the positive aspect of the individual more than the negative aspect, such that when the negative aspect is acted out, the individual tends to undermine and has this belief that the person will change, that maybe some demonic spirits that are acting, that maybe she will pray or he will pray and there will be changes. It becomes worse off if the individual does not even have a reliable source of dependence. For instance, external person, family members that could help out of the problem. Then the thoughts, the cognitive thoughts now begin to come. If I leave this home, maybe I have my children here. What will come out of these children? The man might marry another woman. What will become the future of my children? All these thoughts and concerns and worries tend to tie the individual more into the relationship that the person finds it difficult to be out. Now, because of the tie, the bond that is linking them, even when there are actions to free this person from the relationship, the person does not. At times, it might even, those are some of the, the behavioral manifestations with this syndrome. The individual might even fight other people who tried to free them or who try to exonerate them from this difficulty, this challenging situation. Now, over time, this victim might now start sympathizing with the abuser and start seeing things from the abuser point of view by reasoning along and trying to see some justifications why the abuser is acting in the way he is acting. For instance, there was a case that was reported to me by a client of mine. It was supposed to be their wedding anniversary that particular day. She forgot. It was towards evening. The, the man now drew her attention, challenged her, and was almost hitting her. That is the wedding anniversary. Was it not your responsibility to have reminded me and congratulated us? 
And the woman, the lady came with this problem and she admitted that actually it's my fault. It's, I'm the one that is supposed to remember as the woman in the family. I was now, look, I smiled. I said, where is it written? Where is it documented that it must be the woman that should remind the family of wedding anniversary? So they get to a stage in which they even admit faults unto themselves and this tends to affect them to demoralize them and subject them into the state of depression so they find it difficult to be out of such problems and that is why the other time we are saying of the rules of neighbors the rules of others who see them they do not reason normally again because their cognition has been dented by the abuser the orientation has been negatively impacted by the abuser they now see along the way the abuser is reasoning and another area is that at times the abuser behaves in a friendly way in what we refer to as borderline personality at times they, they become good at times they act possibly like the case we are looking at Osina she i was just reasoning it's very much likely that the man was not aggressive or true at times he might behave good if not why would this type of um, relationship produce four children? It means at times the man was behaving good. And the woman has the tendency of being carried away with those good aspects of the man. Overrates the, good, the perceived good aspect of the man as opposed to the negative aspect. So this makes it difficult for them to withdraw from such relationship like was said also by the counselor you, many thoughts we start from what will people say i could not manage my home um, I'm, I'm unable to the, the culture even sees it that is the woman that should manage the home if any home fails that is the fault of the woman which ought not to, to be so all this cognitive imputation into the woman the the woman or women generally tends to have negative impact on them that they find it difficult to withdraw even when they have been subjected to all this undue violence well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Aguirre, uh, for your insight. We'll come back to you in the course of the conversation. Now, back to the studios. Harry Obey of uh, the National Human Rights Commission is a director uh, uh, at the Human Rights Commission. He was our guest yesterday. Uh, Harry, of course, you listened again to uh, the newer perspectives that have been opened on the conversation uh, this morning. I, I just want you, before you respond to the issues, uh, or take this along with your response to the matters arising from the responses of the guests. Domestic violence, are we dealing with an urban phenomenon or a rural phenomenon or both urban and rural uh, in the first instance? And then uh, what are the hindrances to uh, effective reporting of uh, cases of domestic violence? Thank you very much. Um, to speak straight to your question, whether it is urban or uh, rural, I, I would rather say that it's a human problem. Um, so it does not discriminate against location. But the ability to actually speak out can be influenced by the environmental factors, which can, um, a lot of the times, the urban dwellers appear to have more access to arteries of communication or escalation of their cases, because they are constantly reminded, maybe through the media, that, look, you can get help through this medium and all that. And um, the rural dwellers may not have such opportunities. They are bogged down by tradition, which is one of the causative factors of domestic violence. The, this impression that, look, it, you have to be responsible for your home. Don't allow any other person to hear about the things that goes on in your home. These are traditional cultural beliefs. And so those people dwelling in the rural areas appear to be more drawn or cowed by those beliefs. So they don't speak out as much as the urban dwellers will speak out. So uh, this, th these are the areas you see differences in terms of visibility and all that. So, but I cannot um, say that it is an urban uh, problem or a rural problem. problem. Rather, it is a human problem. And um, I said yesterday that it is innate in every human being to want to dominate or oppress the other. The only thing that deters us or limits the um, exhibition of those things is the certainty of accountability or the awareness of the parties that are involved. Okay. Um, uh, let's come back to, to, to Rita once more. 
uh, you, you're a survivor of, of this, and of course they're a counselor now. I'd like you to uh, you know, speak to some women who may be in the condition you found yourself uh, a couple of years ago, uh, because uh, the issue has uh, you know, centered on the fact that uh, when you are cowed down, uh, you find it difficult, you know, uh, to even report uh, your situation for people to begin to uh, provide that assistance to you. Uh, as a counselor, what, what would you be telling uh, some women who are in bondage at this moment? Because, of course, we know that uh, um, I simply asked whether it's a rural or urban. It's, it's, for me, it is both. Because those days growing up, you come to the village, you always hear cry somewhere that late man always beats his wife and what have you. In some cases, the uh, family members, the extended family, uh, members who call them and they try to settle them uh, and what have you. So, what, how would the women who have found themselves in this situation wriggle out of it, irrespective of uh, uh, what uh, 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 I, I, I guess anybody has explained based on psychology? Yeah. You know, the, uh, I use this my, my experience to really help a lot of people, a lot of uh, abuse, even the abusers, because I've come to realize that most of the abusers have been abused one way or the other. So they had childhood experiences and um, they just feel the way to revenge back is to inflict um, pains to the people they love and all that. So that's distorted uh, cognitive um, mindset. Okay. And I use myself to answer your question. I, I face my reality. I first the reality that I have been abused. It was difficult to accept for a long time. You know, someone that have a lot of uh, religious uh, background, I just feel everything is Satan. So I came to realize there are a lot of things that are not Satan. There are a lot of things that are human, that are under human mind. And uh, the mind, if the mind can be changed, everything can, can get better. So I have to face that reality that I've been abused. So... Do I want to remain here or do I have a life beyond marriage outside what I've been taught that marriage is everything? So I also realized that marriage is good, very good, when the two people involved really know who they are and uh, what they want and they owe each other genuine love. So marriage can be so good if the two parties express this love to each other freely and marriage is one of the means to an end it's not the end itself so i cannot because i want to remain married and died inside the marriage so i had to take that decision too it was very difficult decision <laughs> consider the environment we found found ourselves but it was a bold step and i speak out in fact i speak out the first time I was there, because then, he, after he finished that, he was, he left, he was doing uh, evangelical work and all that. I was always going, but I come, always returned back with pens and all that. So I stopped traveling back. That was what my counselor advised me. He said, stay aside for some time. So during that time of staying aside, I found myself in a new church. I was in a choir. I was singing for more than one year. Nobody knew that I was do, going through that. So they just knew a new me that was laughing, a counselor that I was always there to help as many people as possible. I gave myself to volunt uh, voluntary work and all that. So they didn't know that aspect of me. But the day I decided to speak out, 2019, my birthday, I called all of them that knew me. I said, I want to celebrate my birthday in my house. So one of my counselors, in my last counselor, that was the third counselor, was there. He, he, he was there for me. So, and... There, I spoke out. I opened up. It was people were crying and laughing. One came to tell me, say, Mama, do you know why I'm crying and laughing? Look at my eye. I'm crying because you went through all this and you were still laughing with us as if nothing was wrong. And I'm laughing because you are this strong. You are this strong. I was so strong because I built up myself. I told you when I was going through personal development, I went through a lot of personal development uh, training online to now really know that the problem is me. I have to really discover who I am from inside out, not what the environment is telling me. Because living the world of the environment is like denying who you really are 
as created by God. You know, so you are going through it. Please, that can, that's not you. That, that's just an experience of life. You need help. The first help is to speak out. Accept it. Speak out. Don't just speak to people that you tell, like Osinachi's story I heard. So many friends around her knew, but please don't tell anybody. Of course, they have to respect her. Speak out to a professional, a counselor, you know, that can help you out. That know the implication of what you are going through. Just like that, the, the psychologist said. He said, at that moment, you don't know yourself. You can't think for yourself. Your thought has been controlled by a dominant force, which is your abuser. So, you have to speak out to someone that has been trained. Can, professional counselors have been trained to help you. Please, it is not, except a clergy that no, have understanding of professional counseling, that you now know, okay, you are taking domestic violence or mental health problem to them. They are spiritual inclined. But professional counselors are trained to help your mental and psychosocial problem. Speak out to them. They have to, a way of guiding you through it. I, I think you made a, a, a point here, you know, to say that uh, uh, some persons who are, you know, were passing through uh, such challenges usually go to the pastor yeah. for counseling. Oh, imagine. Yet the pastor does not have the, 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 the background of uh, psychology to understand the concept of psychology in the exactly. first place. Exactly. So he will not uh, give you the proper advice that you need at that point. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. We are specialists in different perspectives. It's just like me coming out there saying I'm a journalist. I said, how? Did I go through the rudiments of becoming a journalist? No. So I can only say the layman understanding that, oh, these people that are on telly, you understand? So as a professional counselor, we are trained to listen. We are trained to keep your secret. We are trained to profile solutions it's a, it's a bit curious, for you. Richard, a bit you curious. Know. I mean, somebody will ask this question. Um, you, you studied psychology. Yeah, counseling psychology. Counseling psychology. And eventually you, you rediscovered yourself. Yeah. Uh, but why did, you, why, did you, why did your defenses fail, uh, Ab Initial? <laughs> that's the what if I someone asked me that openly you know i wasn't i wasn't just a, a counseling psychologist i was a a a, a call a can let me put you see that i always say i was a core religious uh, staunch <laughs> so i felt i knew myself that's why i'm using the word rediscovery i actually thought i knew myself you know the mind is made up of the conscious and the subconscious mind so we are so exposed to the conscious mind so much that we feel that's all the world depends. The subconscious mind are the experiences that have been stored and they keep playing out. That's why when I was talking, I said some of the abusers too may have need help because of their childhood experiences. This thing stores there. And it's actually the subconscious mind that the body acts on because it brings in what has been stored there and you just act on it, you know, program life. So you can know yourself intellectually or cognitively. You are very good in logical uh, reasoning. You are very good in, uh, in, um, in school work. You are very good in goal setting, making setting goals and achieving them. You just thought, oh, I've discovered myself. Wait, you are, you've not really get to that point of taking decision for yourself. You know, taking decision for yourself. Okay. You know. uh, all right, Richard, thanks a lot. Uh, but Titi uh, Vivo, I don't know. You, I, I would like to return to one aspect you talked about, which has to do with uh, the uh, response of the law uh, to uh, cases of domestic violence. You did say that it isn't just criminal, there is also the civil perspective. Uh, you, you talked about the protection or restraining order. Uh, describe to our viewers how that works and how. Uh, it is enforced. Okay. Um, so the law, um, which our law is actually a bit similar to the Violence Against Specific Prohibition Act, which is operational in the FCT. Um, so it makes provision for survivors, victims, to actually go to the closest court. Most times it's the magistrate court and report that they are experiencing abuse. And they, they, once they do that, once they make that report, 
they um, all they're supposed to do is to write like a statement it's a form of an affidavit basically a statement of facts just stating what has happened and the fact that they need the protection of the court and then the whole process now commences but many a times people don't even know survivors don't even know that they can walk up to the court themselves and report this and um, and this this crisis the court is actually can the court can serve as a first responder but majority of the cases we do in Lagos, clients reports to us and then we help them to build their cases we help them to approach the court to obtain this protection or restraining order the restraining order can be valid for two years it can be valid for one year it can be valid for six months it depends on the facts that are presented before the court at the point when the restraining order is it is um, giving it's obviously to protect it's not punitive it's to protect and prevent further reoccurrence but if the alleged abuser violates that restraining order then it becomes criminal that is when criminal um, proceedings can be instituted against the, um, the the perpetrator but you know because of our culture um, and there are different considerations that survivors would um, would deliberate upon before approaching the court. But what we say to survivors is that these cases are heard most times in a family court. They are heard in camera. It's not heard in the open court because the court has, the court understands that these are this is a family issue, and we don't utmost confidentiality should be you know should be uh, preserved when handling these kind of cases. And so it's just to encourage people. I think the, the most important thing is to encourage people that there are up options survivors have options you may not want to go to court you can we can deploy mediation as a form of alternative dispute resolution right there can be separation if you're ready to go to court you can get a lawyer to help you file necessary legal proceedings but do not remain in silence speak up i think that's 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 the message that i would like to drive up there are options and there are support services that exist that can assist survivors. Now, let me remain with you from what you actually explained. I'm just wondering how um, uh, administratively this issue of restraining order is handled. Uh, but uh, you have to hold on for a while. Let's take a short break. When we come back, uh, we'll return to you for that question. This is Good Morning Nigeria, and uh, we are reaching you live on the network service of ANT. We'll take a short break now. When we return, the conversation continues. All right, uh, thank you for staying with us up to this moment on Good Morning Nigeria. And uh, we, are, we are returning uh, to you, uh, uh, Titi Lola, once more. You, you were telling us about, uh, you know, um, how your office you know, handles some uh, issues concerning uh, domestic, uh, uh, domestic violence with respect to uh, the aspect of uh, uh, restraining um the abuser uh, from having contact with, with the abuse for uh, for a reason um uh, how often has this been able to uh, bring uh, sanity in in different homes uh, and uh, is your office really concerned about reconciling homes or do you just go all out to prosecute or jail or uh, um, you know uh, maybe prefer divorce as, as a solution so the way we, we in Lagos we have a strong um coordination mechanism in place because you know that one agency or one ministry cannot sufficiently provide all these services. And so we have a very strong partnership with the police, the Lagos State Police Command. We actually have designated police stations in Lagos State that we work with. So when a restraining order is granted by the court, it serves as a, a judgment of the court. And then we inform the police to assist us in enforcing the order. So that's just to address how we ensure that the orders are adhered to. And then if there is, if the alleged perpetrator flouts the order, then we co commence criminal proceedings or criminal actions against such a person. As an agency, we are survival centered. We are not um, advisors. We do not advise our clients or survivors. We counsel. We lay down the options available and they, we help them to take a decision for themselves that they would own and run it. Majority of our clients, majority of our survivors don't want prosecution. They want the victim to stop. 
And so that's where you have this um, proposition for mediation as a form of alternative dispute resolution. And we place a high premium on counseling because we know that nobody is born an abuser. And if people are ready to work on their relationship, they just need professional support. And so we have a pool of clinical psychologists and psychiatrists that we work with to assist these um, couples if they are interested in remaining in the relationship. We do not beg a survivor to remain in the relationship, no. We believe in self current determination. If a survivor says, I'm done, it's not in our place to compel or coerce that person to remain in an abusive relationship. If the survivor says, I'm willing to give this a ch another shot, but I believe that we need counseling, and the alleged perpetrator is vulnerable and honest enough to say that they need this support, it is, the, it is to the benefit of government if government is able to assist that couple. So no, we do not, we do not coerce people to to remain in abusive relationships, neither do we tell people to, 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 to do what they don't want to do. That's, that's unethical and it's not professional. We are survival centered. As far as it's within the ambit of the law, we do what the survival says. But in a case of public interest, in a case where a survival comes in bleeding, for instance, we are not going to deploy mediation because we believe that this case is a potential murder case. At that point in time, mediation is not going to work. We need to ensure that law enforcement is notified. And, you know, um, we do the need for to ensure that we protect life because it's very critical that we protect life. Uh, Tutila, uh, Titi and Lola, rather, I mean, uh, thanks uh, for your response. I, I, I was going to also ask you, maybe when we get back to you, you can uh, respond to this. Namely, you talked about the services that are available. Uh, are these services paid for? by uh, the couple if they decide to seek help and uh, are negotiators who are involved in this incidents of domestic violence actually uh, stepping up uh, to get help but there's a third leg of what you raised say for instance a victim of domestic violence comes in bleeding this was a point we touched on briefly yesterday, and I would like Harry Obey of uh, the National Human Rights Commission uh, to come in here one more time. Because yesterday, the data he gave was that uh, last year, there were one, at least 1.7 million reported cases of domestic violence throughout the country. And the Honorable Minister of Women Affairs did say that, indeed, those numbers are more because the... Uh, Federal Minister of Women Affairs has a situation room uh, tracking this. Harry, we're back to this issue of, of, of uh, the protocol for handling uh, grievous cases of domestic abuse. Uh, it could, sometimes you can say low scale, but if it's a high intensity, somebody comes in with a broken head, um, somebody comes in with some visible injury, uh, what is the current experience now and how do we correct that? Our, um, my colleague from Lagos State actually stopped with regard to the issue uh, of being survival-centered approach to um, dealing with these issues of uh, domestic violence. The protocol is not cast on stone. You use um, it, it, it the one that is actually workable in, um, in your environment that is deployed. But however, there are some basic considerations that must be infused into whatever local protocols that, uh, that are developed. The first thing is to um, protect the survivor or the victim. And so the protocol requires that the victim or the survivor is removed from the violating environment to at least a safe environment where she, her life or his life will be preserved. And then Whenever you're dealing with issues of domestic violence, know that there are two legs to it. There's a protection um, leg to it, which is ensuring that the survivor is protected. Then there's the legal accountability aspect to it, and that is the criminal angle. So when you're dealing with that, you ensure that, look, while protecting the victim or the survivor, you also have to preserve evidence to ensure that there will be prosecutor and prosecution to ensure accountability for whoever perpetrated that. So when a victim comes with blood and all that, yes, you remove the, keep the victim safe and ensure that that victim has access to medical facilities 
or treatment. And a lot of the times from experience, um, the, 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 the dilemma that a responder faces is when these facilities are not available. One, you don't have a safe home or a safe facility to keep the survivor. And then you have no express access to a medical facility without cost to ensure that at least the victim is stabilized. So there has to be funding and provisions for these two uh, very important first aid steps that must be taken. Namely, again? Namely, um, removal of the, the survivor from the violating environment to a safe place, which can be shelter or a facility, and then medical uh, treatment or access to medical services. So that the, 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 the welfare and the health of the survivor is um, protected while you take further action to ensure uh, full accountability for the crime. Okay, um, I, I want to re return to um, Benjamin Ehiye of the Department of Psychology, University of Ibadan, on this very aspect of uh, uh, our conversation. In most cases, the victim and the uh, abused uh, would have uh, gone through some kind of uh, reconciliation. In the case of Osinachi, we learned that uh, at a point in time, she left the marriage for, for about a year. And uh, the husband came begging and uh, they reconciled. So it, it does appear that uh, in most cases, when people are reconciled and they return to live together, the abuser continues. So what is the psychology behind this? Because when you went to beg to say, look, I am not going to get involved in this again. I have uh, discovered my mistakes. I won't make that mistake again. What happens when they have reconciled? And after a period of time, the man returns to that uh, his original uh, set of behavior. What is the psychological concern about this? I mean, uh, why the re reoccurrence? You know, after uh, reconciliation, you go back to it. After apologizing, you return to it over time. Thank you very much. Like you've narrated, the the abuser experiences on uh, miss of the, the victim, in other words, the absence of the victim from home, which will create some deprivation to him. And this individual might be suffering some psychological disorders. He might be a psychopath. The fact that he realized himself that the wife, for instance, is not present, and all the derivatives which he has been gaining from her is now absent, there is that urge, there is that uh, motivation of trying to reconcile. The reconciliation might not necessarily be that he would no longer victimize her, but the gap that had been created should be filled again. Now, nobody bothers, no one bothers to say, let this person undergo psychological tests and psychotherapy. So that the psychological problem that is existing would be treated. The fact that he has gone back saying that, oh, I've changed. What is or are the evidences? Has the person been transformed? Has his psyche been worked upon? If he's a psychopath, for instance, who derives pleasure in hurting others, in harming others, it will certainly reoccur. So my advice is that the fact that the the abuser goes back apologizing kneeling crying is not a sufficient reason why the abuse should be released back into that environment such individual has to be subjected to psychological tests psychological analysis and adequate therapy psychotherapy conducted for himself and the wife i've had an opportunity of such and i'm so glad to testify that they saw me at times they will say oh thank you for what you did there's the need for psychotherapy to be conducted it could be family psychotherapy whereby both the 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 victim and the abuser they are brought together they are made to understand the causes of the problems causes of the disagreement what leads to physical violence and so on it's so unfortunate that we tend even more to emphasize on the physical violence. But the psychological violence is more enduring because before it degenerates to physical violence, 
the abuse must have been passing through a lot of psychological torture, a lot of psychological um, 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 negative effects upon her, which may include affect her mental state, her reasoning, disassociation from people, loss of attention, loss of contact from people, and so on. All these have to be treated before you can bring them together. So that is my advice. Not so it is very much likely that the abuser will return because nothing has been done to him. There is no change. As he was before, so he is. There is nothing that has changed. The fact that he seemed to look, to look like a repentant offender does not mean that the repentance is there because there is an inherent psychological problem in that individual which has to be attended to before maybe the custodian of the abuse would think of releasing and even releasing the abuse should be on temporary basis with some monitoring and observations to see if there is or there are changes if they are not then it's advisable that the abuse should be withdrawn until perfect treatment psychological treatment has been administered on the abuser when you talk about treatment uh, yet you said the psychological treatment I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just thinking of uh, how this treatment can be administered on an individual. And when you say that uh, somebody's mental state is affected, does it require uh, some kind of medication or, or what? So explain to our viewers what you mean by this treatment and uh, the, the process of such a psychological treatment that could change a man all of a sudden. Well, most of the problems associated with violence, they are behavioral problems they might not be mental breakdown in terms of the physiological uh, breakdown i mean the physical breakdown of the brain by psychological treatment we have what we call chemotherapy which has to do with medication and we have psychotherapy which has to do with psychological intervention psychological intervention does not have to do with the use of medication it has to do with behavioral treatment the individual has problems and the problems could be cognitive it could be the individual's cognitive orientations things that have been imputed in the individual's cognition it could be cultural religious making the individual not to see reality not to see the actual things as they are occurring through cognitive behavioral therapy for instance the individual is now exposed into understanding that there is a problem at times, the victim does not even see what is on ground as a problem. The victim does not see the reality. Through cognitive behavioral therapy, both the abuser and the victim, the abused, they begin to see the reality of events that are occurring. Now, psychotherapy is not something we can just discuss here, but we have professionals in that field. It just requires visiting centers where we have these professionals. In some hospitals, Federal, states, and private hospitals, there are some professionals. Some operate at individual level. They are private practices. But in all, I still say we don't have sufficient centers where these facilities, these services could be provided. For instance, ideally, in police stations, some of these large police stations, we should have psychologists who will be there to administer some counseling services. In uh, community hospitals, um, uh, clinics we should have psychologists who will be there because the, the community um, health center they are very close to the neighborhood now if there is enlightenment when they have such marital problems they can easily go there everything is not medication there is so much belief in medicine med most of these things are behavioral issues someone for instance who is easily aggressive someone who cannot control his or her temper someone who's emotional intelligence is very low does not require any medication all that that person needs is psychological intervention that we a little bit bring up the intelligence the emotional intelligence so that the individual is empowered on how to manage conflicting situation on how to manage conflict on how to manage difficulties challenges on how to manage worries that the person is passing through this is what psychotherapy is all about it's all about behavioral intervention and it helps more better than medication medication might only suppress the individual goes into sleep and gets disconnected from physical sin but when the person is up again is facing the reality but with psychological um, therapy 
you are empowered on how to tackle these issues whenever they emanate. All right, uh, Professor Gates, thank you very much. And, and indeed, the other guests, there, there's one aspect that I would like us to touch on uh, on, on the uh, time frame that we have, or rather within the time frame that we have. Harry, uh, you are Director of Women and Children Department of the National Human Rights Commission. Again, the trigger for our conversation is the death of Osunachi Wanchuku. Four children. Yesterday, the Honorable Minister of Women Affairs narrated her encounter with those children. Pretty young children. They themselves have been brutalized by their father, according to their own testimony. And they have also been witnesses to the, uh, the violence unleashed by their father on their mother. How do you care for witnesses to this kind of violence and bring them out? Uh, because she said yesterday that uh, a 12 year old, you know, has uh, challenges with reading. How, what, 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 what processes are required? What help uh, is needed? I mean, it's, uh, it's an aspect that I think that we ought to look, uh, look into because where, where in the marriage, for instance, uh, where there are already children and violence goes on a repeated basis, uh, how do you deal with this? Yeah, it, um, I, I think that is why this uh, stakeholder connectivity is very important. So it's a multi-level approach that is required because the issues that are thrown up by violence are multi-dimensional. And so we have to have a multi-dimensional approach to solving those problems. Uh, when the Honorable Minister was narrating the, her experience yesterday when she visited the house, my mind was actually uh, filled with, okay, where do we begin? Now, the criminal responsibility angle is being handled by the police. The children are probably still in that house or with their uncle or auntie or a relative somewhere. And we already know what the issues are or the issues are beginning to emerge as to how to intervene. Where is the system? Do we have a system in place where these children can be put through some level of psychological debriefing first before you address their educational needs, before you address their welfare needs? Because now their mother is no more. Their father is facing a prosecution for criminal, um, you know, possible, uh, uh, possible imprisonment. Okay, so they are now separated from their mother permanently. They are separated from their father, who they allege also contributed to their violation. So how do we debrief these children first? So we need the services of psychologists and social uh, welfare practitioners to get involved, have these children stabilized psychologically. Because engagement with the children from multi-agencies to get evidence and hear testimonies that they will use to address the situation is very important. Now, the, there's also the aspect of the judicial intervention or quasi-judicial intervention. I was going to talk to the issue of protection order. You don't necessarily have to go to court. You have some agencies, administrative agencies like the National Human Rights Commission that is empowered by law to make orders that are enforceable as a decision of the high court. Our rules, that is the, we call it STOP, the, the standing orders and rules of procedure provides in, in, in Rule 67 that any matter that is being investigated by the Commission, the Commission can make initial protection orders to ensure that the victim or victims of the complaint are stabilized. And such orders are enforceable as a decision of the High Court. So what are we saying? If the procedure, the, the judicial procedure is cumbersome and it takes some technical processes, approach an administrative agency like the National Human Rights Commission, which services are free of charge, by the way. And then such orders, we should, we should take advantage of those provisions. People need to know. And then, okay, when we deal with the children, you have to deal with the, 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 the system well, itself. Well, uh, Harry, I want to thank you at, at, at this point. Uh, there's no doubt uh, that uh, these children need uh, an extra care, you know, uh, to take care of their uh, psychological well-being, physical well-being, academics, and what have you. And uh, I wish we had more time, you know, to deliberate uh, on this. And at this point, we'd like to uh, call it a day. And uh, we'd like to appreciate uh, Harry Obe, Director of Women and Children Department, National Human Rights Commission. We, we thank you.
Diaspora Insights. And of course, Rita Bassi, domestic violence survivor and counselor, your experience, also, of course, has uh, helped uh, matters in this conversation. Thank you so much. Sani Amar Rabi, Acting Director, Social Welfare Department, Social D Development Secretariat of the FCT. We appreciate uh, your uh, contribution. Uh, uh, guest from uh, Ibado, Benjamin Ehige, Department of Psychology, University of Ibadan. Uh, we also uh, thank you for being part of our program this morning. And the advice room we had uh, from Lagos, uh, Titi Lola Vivo Adeni, Executive Secretary, Lagos State Domestic and Sexual Violence Agency. We also would like to appreciate uh, your waking up with us this morning and your very insightful contributions. All right. Uh, That's good morning, Nigeria, for today. We are back tomorrow, same time. Good Friday at 7 o'clock in the morning to look after ourselves. I'm Kingsley Osadolo. And I'm curious to my department.